word of God, my mind is renewed and my spirit is prepared to receive the word which produces faith and faith. Uh huh. I need somebody that actually believe that. <laughs> Go to 1 John chapter 4, if you would. Please remain standing. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, the reason we stand is we just stand to honor the word of God. The word of God's holy, and that's why we stand. You may say, well, Bishop, I've been places where they sit. And that's how they do it, and that's how we do it. Amen. It won't hurt you to stand just a little bit. They'll stand and celebrate Michael Jackson. They'll stand outside the hospital all day long like he died for your sins or something. People was crying and like they knew him. And certainly he did some great things, but I tell you, Jesus did some greater things. And ain't no way you're going to get me to do all that for, for a man and not do all that for Jesus. You're not hearing what I'm saying. <coughs> Amen. First John chapter 4. And we're praying for his family, of course, during this time. But let that be a message uh, to us all that tomorrow is not promised. And if you live carelessly today, you should fear tomorrow. Hallelujah. But we've got to live every day to its fullest. And we've got to love every day to its fullest because you don't know when your end is. He wasn't planning on dying. Look at somebody and say, li live for real. Tell them, live for real. First John chapter 4, go to verse number 7. We were here Wednesday. But let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God, and what? Knows God. He who does not love does not know God, because God is what? He is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, or the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to do what? Huh? No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. That word perfected just means what? Mature. Uh, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given of us his spirit. And we have seen and testified the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we know and believe the love of God for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Here it is. Love has been perfected or matured among us in this, that we might have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. In other words, look at me. What he's saying is, is the reason that I love is so that when I got to go stand before God Almighty, I can stand and say, Lord, I may have done a lot of wrong, but I loved everybody I came in contact with. Watch this. There is no fear, Greek word phobio, where we get our word phobia, in love, because perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. One more place, First John, you go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 6. Amen. If you buy maps, you, you missed in the wrong place. Verse John, chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought to also himself just walk as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is what? No, 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 no you missed it. He says, when you get this, darkness starts leaving. No, you, you, you're missing it. He says, if you get this commandment of love, then darkness has to start fleeing out of your life. So the reason darkness is still there is because you're still a hater, not a lover. 
Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light but hates his brother is in darkness until right now. Why? Because the word brought the light. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Look at me. Please understand. The Bible just said, if you walk in darkness, you think you know where you're going, but you haven't been where you're going. Let me talk to this side of the church over here. He said, you think you're making progress, but where you're going, you've already been. So he says, if you don't get this love thing down, I don't care how much Bible you know, how much money you got, how many friends you got, you've already been to the place you're going. Which means you're not making progress, you're just being active, which means you're running in place. Father, we have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. Father, I've come to prophesy the word of the Lord to your people today. And Father, we declare by faith now that we are open to receive it. And God, that we, your people, shall hear and we are going to obey your word. Because you have told us and commanded us. You didn't ask our opinion about whether we should or should not love. You told us to do it. Which means that it does not depend on how we feel or what we think. It depends on our obedience. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. Now, I want you to do something unusual. I want you to just get out of your seating area real quick and just high-five somebody and tell them I love you. I love you. There ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I come to prophesy to you once again today. What, what, what's this? I, I, I want to lay this foundation and I want us to get into it. Please understand, the first thing I need you to understand is why I teach the way I do. Please understand, uh, my goal is always to build us. Somebody say build. Uh, but to build, you must first identify the places that are weak in the structure so that you are properly prepared to handle the weight of the next level God is taking you to in your life. If you do not pass this level, you will be immature and unable to handle the weight that comes at the next level. That's why the glory of God in Scripture is defined as weighty. It's defined as something that's heavy because everybody can handle omnipresence, but not everybody can handle glory. You believe God gave you a great vision, so that means God's going to have to let some folk talk about you so that he can determine whether or not you can handle the glory that he's taking you to. That is the reason why people come against you and people hate you and you don't even understand why. The reason is, is because when you are going from glory to glory, from level to level, God needs to ensure you can handle the weight of that glory. You can handle the weight of that level. You, because if you can't handle being talked about, being lied on, being cheated, if you can't handle that, then you cannot handle your vision actually coming to pass. Please understand, being successful just makes you a big target. Being somebody just makes you a big target. Having a happy marriage just makes you a big target. Having a good job just makes you a big target. So now, if you cannot handle the weight, you'll crush and you'll fall. Because somebody say, I'm getting stronger. Please understand this. Uh, most people live lives, watch this, through fogged out glasses. Uh, if you wear glasses, I wear contacts and you used to wear glasses. And uh, if you wear glasses and you ever get around a lot of steam, a lot of heat, your glasses will begin to fog. And when they begin to fog, you, 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 your, your, your ability to see through those things is now impaired. So when you get around a lot of pressure in your life, that pressure can now affect your ability to see things properly. And now you'll start making permanent decisions from temporary locations. You'll start doing things that you really didn't want to do, saying things you really didn't want to say, because all of the heat from the hell that's going on around you has now affected your ability to see properly, and now your glasses are fogged out. 
That's somebody say he's going somewhere. Please understand this. And people that live through fogged out glasses can't see anything clearly. And because they judge everything and everyone by previous experiences. Their current husband is paying for things three husbands ago did. Their current job is paying for stuff four jobs ago did. Because people live through these fogged out glasses. Tell somebody to say, your glass is clear. Please understand this. I said this on Wednesday. Experience does not mean wisdom. Please understand. Just because you've done something doesn't mean that you actually learned anything from what you've done or learned anything from what you've been through. Please understand. When you grow from your experiences, that is wisdom. And wisdom is the principal thing. And therefore, in all thy getting, get an understanding. Which means that I can go through a lot and still be a first grader. Which means you can go through a lot and have never matured because you never learned anything. You just got fogged out glasses. And you call your fogged out glasses experience. And so now you're walking around trying to tell everybody what they ought to do. And if you were them, what you do and all this. Yet you ain't never passed the grade you've been at. You, you, you ain't passed kindergarten trying to give a sophomore advice. <sighs> Touch somebody say he's going somewhere. Please, please understand this. Fogged glasses equals the spirit of offense. I'm going to say it again because your neighbor didn't hear it. Fogged out glasses, which means I judge everything by previous pressure and previous experiences, is the spirit of offense. Okay. All right. You still here? I said you still here? Uh, please understand this. The word offense, where we get the word offended from. You ever met somebody that every time you talk to them, they're offended by something? I'm offended by the temperature. I'm offended by this. I'm offended by this. I'm offended by this. I'm offended by that. Why? Because they operate with the spirit of offense. Okay, so let me teach you. Watch this. Uh, the number one definition for the spirit offense means this, an act of stumbling, a cause or occasion uh, for sin. Uh, the second one means something that outrages the moral or physical senses. Here's the third one and where I wanted to get to. It is the act of attacking. The means or method of attacking or attempting to score. Please understand, uh, how many people you watch football or, or basketball? What is the offense trying to do? They are trying to score on the other team. And that's how offended people are. They're always trying to score points on everybody else. So let me get some points. Let me prove that one for me. Ooh, I really got them upset. One for me. And the real truth of it is offended people really think everybody else is just as nasty as them. And so they figure, let me get them first so I can score the points first. Maybe I just put the suit jacket back on because it's too rough here. Uh, the fourth definition for offense, it's the act of displeasing or affronting. It is the state of being insulted or morally outraged. What happens is, is when you get foggy glasses now, you walk around seeking negative. So the Bible teaches us a principle. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Which means if I'm offended and I've got the spirit of offense because i got foggy glasses by all the stuff I've been through, I go around seeking negative. So it is no mystery why I find it everywhere I go. Please understand, you can come here and we can say all oh, churches aren't the same, come see why. But if you come with the spirit of offense, you're going to find something wrong. And if I come looking in your life, I'm going to find something wrong. If you look for something negative, you're always going to find it. But my God, when you look for something good, when you look for the positive in people, you're going to find that. So if you got a lot of negative, it's because you seek that. I wonder why certain people, when it's always drama going on in your family and drama going on, it's always the same people. Because they've got the spirit of offense. Their glasses are so fogged up, and they're walking around thinking they got 20-20 vision. <sighs> That's your neighbor say he's going somewhere. Uh, please understand this. The word culture, and I am teaching part two of creating a culture of love. 
Uh, the word culture, and I said this on Wednesday, is the sum total of the ways of living built up by a group of humans that's transmitted from one generation to another. Please understand. The culture we live in teaches us to hate. It teaches us to be mean to folk. It teaches us to be nasty to folks so that we can get over. It teaches us to get all you can and then can all you get. And what has happened is that has been passed down from generation to generation. There used to be a day where we had neighborhoods, and in neighborhoods you could go down the street and ask uh, uh, Miss Shirley them for some sugar. Miss Shirley them would give you some sugar. Today, Miss Shirley wants a promissory note that promises you're going to bring her sugar back by next Friday. There used to be a time where in our neighborhoods, and I don't know about here, but where I'm from, in our neighborhoods where everybody would come together, and please understand, if you was acting up down the street, they could whoop you down the street just as if you was at home. But you can't do that no more. Don't you be hurting my kids. I'm calling social services. Well, I'm calling the police because you got Freddy Krueger in your house, and he's wanted. Michael Myers is a fugitive. <laughs> They're looking for him in Haddonfield. Watch this. Culture is what we do, what we accept, and what we don't do, and what we don't accept. Please understand, I had a great maternal upbringing. My mother taught us how to love. And please understand, we go around in the middle of the night and for hours, you know, back and forth, about 10, 15 minutes. I love you. 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 And just in case you didn't think, you know, you didn't think they really understood because you had a fight or something earlier that day. Well, I love you. Please understand, the culture that I was bred with was a culture of love. It was a culture of acceptance. It was a culture of unconditional love. But the problem is, most saints were not raised that way. They were not given that kind of culture. And so now you get saved and you bring your Adam culture into your kingdom experience and wonder why you have a mess. P -p Please understand this. The main enemy to a culture of love is the desire to remain complacent with an immature love. Stay with me. I'm doing part two, so you got to get part one. It's a culture of love. The enemy, uh, please understand, let me, let me make an announcement to you. Your enemy uh, to love is not the devil. Your enemy to loving folk is your decision. Because until you make a decision to love, and your love stops becoming this emotional thing, or where when you feel like it, you do. But when you don't, you don't. What I found is most people that think they're really loving really are hateful. They're just really loving to the ones that they love. Ask somebody, say, you love me? And I answer them. Don't y'all be lying in church now. <laughs> the reason that many of us have immature love and our young people have immature love because they see immature love modeled in the culture. That's the reason why we got... People that will jump into relationships and it's been two and three weeks and two and three days and you're talking about this is the one. Because your love is immature. Because the you love is when I see you, I want to do something with you. Which is another word, the Greek word epithemeo, where we get the word lust from. I love you as long as you got them spaghetti straps on. But don't you put on no sweatshirt, because my love is gone. Uh, you know, I just got to be me, and so I just am who I am, and so I'm just going to preach the way I am. Are you still here? Say mature love. Uh, what, what says? Love is a decision, not an emotion, not a feeling. Parents, there are days where you may not feel at all 
like loving. Matter of fact, you feel like they keep threatening to call the folk on you. You feel like I'm going to call the folk on you. <laughs> Come get her. Watch this. Watch this. Love is a choice. Watch this. Not to hate. H hear me. H I need to get this. I need to get this. If I don't love, by default, I hate. So therefore, love is a choice to do everything opposite of hating. And that is the reason why a lot of folk feel like the only way they can build themselves up is to tear other folk down. Because their value is contrived from what they see as their advantages over others. Are you still here? It's real quiet in the church. Watch this. Love is being perfected in us, which means love is a what? Process that should be improving daily. Oh, I says, love is a choice not to be like Adam. You know Adam, don't you? Adam, as soon as something went wrong, all of his, you bone in my bone, flesh in my flesh. Baby, I love you. You're woman. <laughs> All of that lovey dovey talk went out the window when he got in trouble. <laughs> you ever been with somebody like you ever met somebody like that? They with you and they for you and they I got your back. See, if don't nobody else got your back, I'm with you. I got your back. And as soon as the little storm hit. Some of you sitting next to him right now, watch this. <laughs> That's a joke, Denver, please. Don't send me no emails. Every day, God, and I said this on Wednesday, sets love tests in front of you as an opportunity to cast out fear and to perfect or to mature your love. And I said this on Wednesday to you, that every day God is like Wiley Coyote. He will set something in front of you, and then he'll leave it there, and then he'll run back and see what you're going to do. And you're going through your life, you're the road runner. You're going through your life running fast because you're always so busy doing this, doing that, doing that. Ooh, honey, I'm just busy. I'm busy, man. I'm busy, man. I'm busy, man. I'm busy. I'm just so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. You ain't done nothing, but you're busy. It's amazing. You ever send somebody to the store and it takes them two or three hours to get back and you say, what took you so? What have you been doing? You're messing my so busy that they, they ain't doing nothing? Ooh, I'm busy. <laughs> you ain't done nothing. You vacuumed the house. <laughs> Explain to me how that makes you busy. I can vacuum the house, send 100 emails, write a couple books, in 20 minutes. There are three places, and I'm going slow today because I, I want us to get this in our spirit today. There are three places that God is going to test the maturity of your love. Three places. You ready? First place is on your job. Look at your neighbor say, show you right. Some of y'all, every time you go into work, you be going in there pleading the blood of Jesus, and you got your oil, and you go in there because you're saying, Lord, I'm getting ready to go. I know where hell at. It's right here. <laughs> you want to send somebody to hell, Lord, send them down there over here. Right? Your job is the first, one of the first places God is going to test the maturity of your love. What does it mean to test the maturity of it? It means to put pressure on it. See, I don't know how perfected or how mature or how strong this table is until I put somebody on it. It looks real strong holding this little thing. Well, that must be a strong table. If I was with the power team, I'd do... 
and the thing would break, and then I'd find out that I thought it was very strong, but under pressure, it wasn't. And so that's what God does to your love wall. He tests it and puts it under pressure and says, you think you love, you think you got this, you think you're a given person, let me put you under some pressure. Because remember, God's trying to prepare you for what? The next level. And for the next level, you got to be able to handle the weight that comes with this level. So if you can't handle getting talked about folks right now, you might as well just hang up the, hang up the phone on your vision. Are you still here? He's going to test your love walk with your coworkers. My God. And they're going to come to you and say stuff to you. Oh, you think, oh, you, oh, oh, you probably ain't going to come with us to the bar because you're a Christian. Probably not. Well, you think you're better than us. No, I know. <laughs> but so what do you mean I know? Because I know I'm better than that lifestyle. I don't got to go drink to have a good time. You can give me an aquafina and two cookies and I'm. That's why they call it spirits. If I got to get some spirits in me before I'm having a good time, something is terribly wrong. I just need to loosen up. You get, go to tapo class on Monday nights. He's going to test your love work with your supervisors. Because they're going to say stuff to you, and you're going to say, well, how am I supposed to get that done? Well, how am I going to do this? And God says, I'm putting some pressure to test your love walk, to see if you can love. And then if you're in management, he's going to test your love walk with your subordinates. Because they're always going to be late. They're always going to have excuses for why they didn't get it done. They're never going to follow the standard procedure that they're supposed to follow. And then they're always going to want grace. Oh, I'm in the house. And then you got to be able to say, Lord, they deserve some tongues in English. Come on now. Look at the neighbor and say, be for real. I know you're saved and Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized and all that. But sometimes your fire gets a little low and you want to say some stuff and you want to get back at them and say, so, oh, they think they're going to talk to me like this, so I got something for them. They don't know who they're messing with. I'm from Littleton. I'm from Parker 225. <laughs> they don't know who they're messing with. I've been at this company 20 years, and they come in here one day and trying to turn my system around. He's going to test your love walk. Second place he's going to do it is in your house with your family. You still here? I told you I'm going a little slow. I'm going to preach it real fast here in just a minute. So you better stay with me. Uh, the reason it can be tough to love folk that's close to you is because sometimes it's easier to give grace to strangers than it is to those you know. And you'll forgive and be nice to everybody out, out in the street and all this, and you'll be nice. You come home and just mean it in a junkyard dog. It's amazing when I see kids and say, but they just like that. No, they're not because they don't do it to me. He's going to test your love walk with your family. And it's easy to get offended with your family, foggy glasses. It's easy to get offended with your family because you're with them every day. So you figure we'll just, you know, whatever. We'll argue and fight and all that and we'll make up. The problem is, the book said, don't let the sun go down. 
on your wrath or on your anger, which means that every night you go to sleep mad at somebody, if judgment comes to you in the middle of the night, which means before every day ends, I got to get everything right with everybody because I'm not going to stand before the Lord. What did the text say? I'm going to stand before him sure on the day of judgment and say, Lord, I forgave everybody, and if they didn't forgive me, that's on them, but I did my part. Lord, I loved everybody I was supposed to love because I'm not going to stand before God and be accused of being a hater. Especially husbands and wives. Because it's easy to just figure we'll, we'll talk about it in the morning. But, but how many folk morning never comes? Well, you go sleep on the couch. Well, fine. You just need to pray. No, you need to pray. <laughs> you heard what Bishop said at church. No, did you hear what he said? I got the tape. I took notes. You wouldn't even have your Bible open. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Say he in the Kool-Aid. <laughs> well, uh, 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 this. Watch this. You got to learn to love family folk. And I'm going to teach over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about mature love. Because mature love means I can love you, but sometimes I got to love you from a distance. Love don't mean fellowship. Which means, listen, listen, big mama, I love you, but you crazy. So I'm going to love you from a distance. And I ain't got to bring the kids over there if you're going to say a bunch of mess in their ear and all this kind of stuff. No, they ain't coming. They'll come with me. They'll leave with me. Because you ain't going to transfer none of that negativity onto them. Sometimes you got to learn how to love from a distance. But the third place, and where I want to get to, that God's going to test your love walk is in the church. He's going to test your love in the church. And the reason he's going to test it in the church because he wants to see if what you say at the end of every service you mean. You don't want to be saying love God, love people, love life. Our trademark saying, by the way. So he wants to see, are you really going to do it? Because a lot of people come to church with the baggage from their last seven And we don't do that here. Look at somebody say, we love around here. And so what they want to do is remember, they've got the spirit of offense. So they're like a little lion. They're like a little cat. <laughs> I got to scar somebody up. I got to mess somebody up. Because they remind me of us, 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 us Tommy at last church. So I got to scar them up before they scar me up. Because remember, offended people really think everybody is just as, as nasty as them. So their predisposition about you is you already, uh-huh, smiling at me. Talking about I look nice today. <laughs> Bishop telling me my hair look nice. He tell everybody their hair look nice. See, that's what I be talking about. Foggy glasses. Gonna tell me I'm a man of God. My name is Craig. <laughs> Don't call me woman of God. I am Benita the Third. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> I ain't gonna mess with that. <laughs> It's amazing because people will come to church and remember whatever you seek, you're going to what? Fine. So they'll come to church. And, well, why he got them men standing around him? He got uh, them bodyguards. Why he got bodyguards? And why they got earpieces in? See, look, everybody looking at him now. <laughs> I'm the one preaching. You look, you look up here. It's amazing because folks will get offended by stuff ain't got nothing to do with you. Yeah. 
Well, why we got to come and stand in the line and shake his hand? Why he can't walk out to us and shake our hands? Huh? The reason y'all ain't saying nothing, because some of y'all, <laughs> your toes is all out. <laughs> well, well, why did everybody around there, why did they say, yes, sir? And why did they say, yes, ma'am? And why did they look nice? <laughs> no, you, you think I'm making this stuff up? You're going to send my email someday. These are real life examples. I was going to call names, but the Holy Ghost said, hold up. <laughs> oh, but if I did, I could. Titus 1 says I can. Why does that person say hallelujah so loud? Can somebody please tell them that, you know, that I would like to be a little bit more quiet around here. <laughs> Number one, the armor bearers are for me, not for you. And they're not bodyguards. They serve the man of God. I'm just taking this as an opportunity just to explain it to you so you know. So when you bring friends to church, you can explain to them. Oh, they're just there. Well, I ain't seen that at my last church. Well, maybe your last pastor wasn't the bishop. Well, he was. Maybe he wasn't the real one. I got papers. I didn't make myself one. Ain't bodyguards. They're just there to, to, to help and assist me. Hey, man, I forget stuff, so they're there to help me remember stuff. Amen. 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 <laughs> you know how offended people be getting? And then they'll go and they'll get out there and they'll talk trash to people that, that and they don't get the opportunity to get the truth from what really happened. And they'll talk trash about the bishop and, you know, and why we got to stand for the man of God. I ain't never stood for no pastor. That's why you're at your 18th church. And what you don't know is we talk. We know who you are. We meet and got photos. Watch out for this one. Watch out for that one. Watch out for that one. Ooh, really watch out for that one. Oh, we know the deal. <laughs> Look at somebody say, don't get offended in here. This is the worst place to get offended. It is amazing how many people are ran away from their destiny because they get offended by something they didn't even understand. And I said this on Wednesday. A, a lot of people, get, you know, I may act, we'll be walking in the hall or something. I may, you know, accidentally not see them. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he didn't see me. Obviously not. I promised I would have stopped if I did. But you didn't come get in the line. You see how stupid this stuff sounds when you talk it out loud? But then why do so many saints allow themselves to get offended by stuff? Do you see how stupid it sounds when somebody says it to you? It's dumb. We cannot keep getting offended about stupid stuff. Now somebody punch you and put holes in your tires and cuss you out. Okay. <laughs> I understand getting a little upset. But you mad because they hugged the two people around you, and by the time you turned around to see them, they didn't hug you. And so now you think, so you get on the phone with everybody at the church trying to figure out why they didn't hug you and what's that's all about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And most folks won't preach about this stuff. They just want to glaze over it. But I got to preach about it because we got to have mature love. Somebody say something right there. You don't come here for other folk. You come here to get the word from this sacred desk 
to hear the word of God, to worship the Lord. And so if so-and-so don't like me, if so-and-so do like me, whatever, but you ain't running me away from my man of God. You're not running me away from my church. You're not running me away from the place God has set me to be because I am mature. My love is being perfected. I know who I am. You ought to try that stuff with a rookie, man, but I've been in this too long. Somebody shout hallelujah. So now watch this. Now I can preach it. Here we go. Kingdom equals what? Heaven's attributes on earth. It, heaven is God's culture, which means when we manifest the kingdom, we are manifesting God's culture. And God's culture and the world's culture are two totally different things. Are you still here? Uh, please understand this. What did the book of 1 John says? God is what? Love. So therefore, if we have a culture of love, we have the culture of God. Are you still here? The problem is, is we've got varying understandings about what love looks like. Because you've had a bunch of misunderstandings about what real love is all about. And what love is this. What love is when you feel butterflies and you get goosebumps and... And love is when, you know, I can't even put it in words. See, that's how I know you ain't really got love. Because I can quantify love. So if you can't put, let me, let me help some of the dating folk and single folk. If they're talking about, I just, I can't even describe it. They lying. They are lying, L-Y-I-N-G. Big Mama used to say that's a lie. Because I should be able to quantify my love. Jesus quantified his love for us with his death and his resurrection. So my love for you should be able to be quantified. And your love for me should be able to be quantified. And if I can't put it in words, then it ain't graduated to love yet. It's just still really strong like. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I just saved somebody. I could have saved somebody two marriages right there had they known that. But they said, well, tell me what I, tell me how, tell me how you love me. Well, you know, I just, I can't even put it into words. You just, mm-mm, mm-mm, then you ain't the one. Because I need some words. I need to be able to add this thing up. Watch this. Watch this. Go to 1 John chapter 3. So, if we get the understanding of what God says love is, then we can manifest the culture of God. Would you agree? So we're going to do this. We're going to run through this. Give me five minutes. We're going to run through this. Here we go. Where did they go? First John chapter 3. Go to verse number 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not what? Huh? So look at that neighbor again. Say, do you love me? Watch this. From this, uh, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should what? Love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and he murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. That's the world. But the church should be a different thing. He said, don't be surprised if atheists and stuff are talking about you. Don't be surprised if agnostics talk about you. Don't be surprised if CNN talking about you. But he said, if, if the church can't get it together, and that's the problem. A lot of times the church is trying to go fix the world, and we ain't fixed ourselves. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a what? What does it say? And you know that no murderer is getting eternal life abiding in him, has it abiding in him. By this, we what? No love, which means I can put a quantity on love. My God, I wish y'all were here. Because he laid down his life for us. Also, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever sees this world's good and shuts up his brother, uh, and sees his brother need and shuts up, underline his heart, because that's important, from him, how does the love of God abide in him? See, this is one of the scriptures that people have taken out of context. Well, if, I got, if you got something I need and you don't give it to me, you don't love me. Uh-uh, that ain't what the text said. The text said, if you see your brother in need, but you shut up your heart, 
which means you didn't even think about maybe another way you could help them. See, please understand, love is not giving everything to everybody. Sometimes love is saying, nope, I want to do it for you, but I can't do it for you because I'm not going to enable you to not get up and get a job and live your life and do and be who you're supposed to be. I love you too much to leave you the way you are. So I didn't shut my heart up, but I did shut up my checkbook. That's what the text says. Don't shut up your heart. What is your heart? Your mind. He said, at least take thought. If they need something, maybe you can point them to somebody that can give it. Maybe you can point them to a place that can get it. But don't think that you're being Christ-like when you give everybody everything. That is not being Christ-like. Because sometimes you're getting in God's way. Because you're becoming an enabler so that people never have to grow up. They never have to take responsibility for their own life. Anybody know somebody like that? Why, why, why would they get a job if they can come get money from you? I mean, that's just dumb. If I can sit at home and watch Moria all day, and you're going to give me money, I'd be a fool to go to work. <laughs> Love means if I see you in need, I take heart to it. And I think, okay, what, what really needs to happen here? But it does not mean that I always meet the need. Are you here? So, so we got to understand what love is. Somebody say, we got to understand. P -p Please understand this. <coughs> love equals light. Hatred equals darkness. Mature love means a mature Christian. Now watch this. Love is comprised of two things. Say it with me, compassion and truth. Say it again. Compassion and truth. Compassion is a choice to love in an instance where you may not desire to nor have a reason to. Say it again. Compassion is a choice to love in an instance where you may not desire to nor have a reason to. Please understand, there's some times where God will move you with compassion. Matter of fact, go to Matthew 14. How many minutes ask you for? Five? Which in preaching minutes means I try to get you out by about two. <laughs> I'm joking. Some of y'all really got grab your purse like, well, I got to go. Matthew 14, go to verse 14. Compassion and truth is love. So here's what we're gonna say. Love doesn't lie to you, it tells you the truth about you. You ever had somebody ask you, give me, tell me what you think and be honest. And then you tell them what you think. I don't believe you said that to me. Well, then you should not. You should have told me to lie then. Love is truthful. Which means love is going to tell you, if you keep jumping from relationship to relationship to relationship, love is going to tell you, oh, excuse me, baby. Excuse me. Excuse me. It ain't all of them. Mm -mm, it really is not. It's you. How can they say that to me? I thought they loved me. Hatred lies to you. You know, there's just no good man. There's just no good man, and you're just a woman of God, and God knows him. And that's why you can't find nobody, because you're just in the spirit, and every man can't understand you. Whoa. Now, they lying. Let me help you. They lie. That's a lie right there. You want to know the truth of the lie? I just gave you. There's your, your instant polygraph right there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh, don't nobody understand me, and don't nobody get me, and no, 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 no. A liar is going to tell you, see, that's because. But the truth is going to tell you, well, that's because you're standoffish, you're rude, you don't smile at people, you do this. <laughs> there go them foggy glasses. Tell somebody to say, I love you. Matthew 14, 14. So let's see what compassion does. I got to get through this real quick. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with what? Compassion and for them, and he healed the sick. Compassion heals others. If you're always hurting people, you're not loving people because compassion heals people. Compassion heals people. Uh, flip over to Matthew 15, 32. Matthew 15, 32. Matthew 15, 32. Here we go. 
Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they should faint on the way. Watch this. Compassion is thoughtful. So you say things like, I just don't have a good memory. Then get you a memory book so you can put the people's birthdays you say you love down so that you can at least say something to them, send them a text, send them a tweet, send them an email, Facebook them something. Amen. If you're a member here and you put your stuff in membership services, you're going to count on getting something for me every birthday. You ain't got to worry about it. Don't nobody else get you no gift. Your bishop is going to get you something. But here's what an offended person would do. I didn't get no card. Well, obviously, your stuff ain't in the system. I, didn't, I ain't been back. Bishop didn't get me no card. I just ain't been back. I just been having time with the Lord, watching Joel. <laughs> Compassion is thoughtful. Compassion sees somebody struggling with something, trying to get in the door, and don't look at them and say, my God, somebody ought to help them. <laughs> Compassion goes and helps them. It's thoughtful. Compassion, if they see somebody sweating and just, just my God, just wetting up all their clothes because it's 100 and something degrees outside and all that. Compassion, don't look, my man, somebody ought to get them some water. Compassion says, you got 14 bottles sitting in your back seat. You can give them one. Are you here? Husbands and wives, I got time. It's thoughtful. It doesn't remember the anniversary after you got up in the morning and said, you know, today's our anniversary. And you get her an Easter card. It's thoughtful. It's thoughtful. Are you here? It means your car ain't washed, husband. And hers looked like she didn't been through Iraq or something. <laughs> well, she wanted wash. You know where to wash at. Be compassionate. You said you loved her. You go take her car to the car wash. And you arm her all the tires. And you vacuum it out. Or take it down the street and that'll do it for you for ten dollars. <laughs> go to Matthew 18, 27. Are y'all still in here? I'm about through. Matthew 18, 27. Here we go. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, compassion, released him, and forgave the debt. Compassion looses people and forgives. Compassion does not hold people accountable uh, in terms of you, you holding on to stuff from 10 and 15 years ago and you won't let it go. That's not compassion. Compassion looses and compassion what? Forgives. Uh, next thing, you can write the scripture down, Matthew 20 and 34. Compassion tells the truth so that people can see clearly. Compassion tells the truth. Write the scripture down. I'm not going to go there for a second time. Mark 6, 34. Compassion teaches. This is what do you mean? A lot of times you get offended because people don't know how to love you because you won't teach them how to love you. Well, he don't love me the way I need to be loved. You ain't told him nothing. I just want them to know. That's the problem. So compassion says, you know, if you're in a relationship, I receive love like this. And I need love like this. And in a married relationship, okay, I like to cuddle. Or I get hot. So please get off of me. <laughs> Ten minute intervals. Compassion teaches. So if you get offended when somebody, see, uh, let me tell you, let me tell y'all a secret. When people do this to me, <laughs> this is the worst thing. 
Now watch folks start doing it after church. Foggy glasses, start trying to do this at church. Excuse me, Bishop. <laughs> I just don't like this. I <laughs> Somebody over in this section did this to me once. I don't like that. You got a little stuff you don't like. I don't like that. So I don't get all mad. I don't believe this person did that and they're going to put their finger to me like that. I'm the man of God. You ain't going to do that to me. No, I just said, please don't. Just, just don't do that. Just do this. Or tell one of somebody, do something, but please don't do this. It's getting under my skin just doing it. I'm telling you. I'm getting aggravated just doing it. So compassion teaches. I, I, I got another thing. I got another thing, and I'm through. I really am. I'm going to finish this next week. I don't like when people, when people pat me on the back. I just don't like that. Now, I love hugging, but I hate when, come here, son, come here. Just stand right here. I hate when, you know. <laughs> and somebody taller than me, y'all know you, Bishop, you know, I'm a little short, and so when people do this. <laughs> Thank you, son. I don't like that. But I don't get all offended and going crazy and I don't leave it. I'm leaving the church. <laughs> I just say, when you hug me, can you just, just rub or something or just, but please don't pat. Now watch everybody gonna be self-conscious when they come down now. <laughs> I won't get offended. I won't get offended. I'm using this as an example. See, you have little things that you get offended by, and you keep getting offended with folk, and all you got to do is tell them, you know what, I just, can you just not do, can you do it like this? Teach people how you receive love. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? Watch this. Last thing. Say culture of love. Number one, how to, how to do it. I'm going to get to you real quick. Number one, you got to get the tape. Don't make assumptions about one another. This is how we breed a culture of love. Stop assuming. Ask questions. When you said ABC, can you tell me what you meant? Opposed to making an assumption, and now you're mad and you're upset now and you all this and you want to write me a letter and all this kind of stuff. Just ask them. Can you tell me what you meant when you said you couldn't stand me and you didn't want to be in the room with me. <laughs> I just want to be sure I understood what you said. <laughs> Did you really mean you couldn't stand me and didn't want to be? <laughs> you got to ask questions, y'all. <laughs> Don't make miscalculated judgments. How many people have you gotten upset? A situation happened a few weeks ago, and, and I thought it was one thing. And so I, you know, I, I was a full steam ahead thinking it was one thing, and I found out it was something else. And once I found out what it was, I said, wow, if I had acted on that assumption, it would have been totally wrong. But a lot of saints, you, not you, but your neighbor, acts on assumptions. And they'll fall out with friends over something they assumed. And they'll fall out with church folk over something they assumed. And they didn't even ask to get facts. Touch somebody say, ask me. Second thing, communicate and tell somebody if something hurts you. Tell them, not everybody else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't go around telling everybody, you know, I wasn't going to say nothing. But so-and-so really offended me when they did this. You know what your response needs to be? Before you finish. Have you told them? Well, I just, you know, I just, you know, I don't know if I can say that. Then it obviously really didn't hurt you. Because cause go through that drive through and let them not give you your fry. You'll be late going back to work, going back. I was just through the drive through and y'all didn't give me my fry. Oh, please, church, come on now. Y'all know what y'all be doing. I'll be seeing y'all. I asked for cheese on my Whopper. Man, you think people could put cheese on a doggone sandwich. I asked for cheese on my Whopper. You'll tell them that, but you won't tell somebody you say you love. You know what? 
Are you here? This is just too raw for Sunday. I should have said this for daddy's girls or something or something. Three, be slow to respond. One of the things I learned I have to do is be slow to respond. Don't instantly, <clears throat> you mean and bit somebody's head off. Slow down. Don't be so quick. Fourth thing, are you here? Give grace that you need out to others. See, if you know you can be misunderstood a lot, then stop getting mad at people when you misunderstand them. <laughs> Give grace to people the same amount of grace you need. And the last thing, and I said this already, stop seeking negative. You look hard enough, you're going to find something wrong with everything. So we make a choice because we're breeding a what? Culture of love. Y'all a good class. We make a choice not to focus on that, but we make a choice to focus on the positive. Are you here? Now, now we're going to do something. Everybody stand on your feet. We're going to do something right quick. Thank you for tuning in to today's life-giving message. Harvest exists to change lives by leading people to totally love God, love people, and love life as one church in global locations. And if you have a testimony of how Harvest has changed your life, let us know on our website contact us page. We're able to continue to change lives because of the faithful giving of people just like you. And if you'd like to contribute to Harvest financially, you can do so today online at www.harvestcc.me. Remember to love God, love people and love life.